Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be here. Uh, it's good to know that uh, holiness is alive and well here at APU. Somebody say amen. amen. Wow, all right. Um, so I, I grew up as a Pentecostal, and as was just mentioned, um, I went to Western Evangelical Seminary in 1989, and I was there for about four years. And that was really my exposure for the first time to uh, Christian traditions outside of Pentecostal traditions, and uh, also where I got my first uh, graduate theological education. Western Evangelical, I think, is very similar, in ter or Western Evangelical now, George Fox, um, I'm sorry, Western Evangelical, then George Fox now. Quite similar, I think, in many respects to the ethos that's here at APU. When, I uh, appreciate Don Thorson for the invitation and for the committee that met for the invitation to come in and be here with you today. Uh, and when the invitation came, I thought, well, I'd like to maybe spend a few minutes, a, a little bit of my time today, thinking about a topic, this topic, holiness, given that it's the theme of the lectures, uh, from my Pentecostal perspective, particularly since I've had 25 years uh, of, of benefiting from having had a, a holiness education, holiness theological education at Western Evangelical Seminary, um, and, and that's also played itself out in my work uh, in different ways, although not particularly on the theme of holiness over the last 25 years. But that's never too late to begin to be holy. Somebody say amen. <laughs> <coughs> I've entitled these uh, reflections this afternoon and this evening, Holiness After Entire Sanctification. We can uh, try to discern what the after means here in terms of there's a few ways in which we might take this after, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll attempt to unpack some of that in the course, particularly of this afternoon. Um, what does it mean to, to be holy within the holiness tradition, and, but broader we, as, as, as Christians, as believers, and in the third millennium? So we've had a few hundred years now of thinking about holiness. Uh, some folks, many around here, have thought about it a lot more than Pentecostals like us have, but uh, it's, it's never too late to begin thinking about holiness, and, and particularly then again about uh, holiness with regard to Christian life for this particular time, 200, 300 years after Wesley, uh, after the holiness movement, uh, or again, we can say after in the sense of still living with. So there's a sense in which uh, what has gone before us is never completely gone, but is still with us in some respect. There are going to be two parts to what we're going to be talking about. I'd like to spend the first part this afternoon in thinking more particularly at a theological level. So I entitled this first part toward a theology of holiness. And again, this after notion in a post-entire sanctification era. Uh, we'll try to unpack that a little bit. What, what does it mean for us to think about our time uh, in terms of entire sanctification and then in terms of being post-entire sanctification? Uh, we might want to begin to orient ourselves to the debate uh, that many of us, I think, have heard or maybe we've participated in terms of our time as a post-modern time. Some people might say that post-modernity is after modernity has been gone. Others might say, well, no, post-modernity simply means hyper-modernity. Modernity sort of uh, intensified at a certain level. And others try to find different sorts of nomenclature. Some, and I use language like late modernity. And I toyed with the idea of, what about a theology of holiness in a late entire sanctification era? You know, or in a hyper entire, I don't think that works too well, right? Um, but again, I mean, I'm inviting you to think about, you know, entire sanctification, and then also about what it might mean for us today in the 21st century, vis-a-vis -vis the trends that, uh, and, and, the, and the legacies and histories that inform our inhabiting this space, this, this holiness space, in the second decade of the 21st century. I want to think a little bit more theologically um, this afternoon uh, in order to set us up perhaps for some more practical reflections uh, in the later session where we'll, we'll talk about how the theology translates into practice or how practice also feeds back into theology. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's try to situate our thinking about holiness in, in our particular time. And so again, I want to, to use this language of post-entire sanctification to recognize the fact that we've had um, uh, long histories of thinking about, wrestling with, arguing about entire sanctification. 
Those histories continue to inform our, our efforts today in some respect, oftentimes maybe in ways in which we do not recognize because a lot of times traditions uh, of, of contestation continue to shape our current climate that m many of us may not have any conscious knowledge about, right? So even if we've sort of gone beyond something, uh, oftentimes it's still in our midst, even if in other kinds of languages. So I want to spend a few moments sort of trying to unpack our current situation with regard to holiness, and I want to think about it particularly in relationship to this notion of entire sanctification. Um, and you'll see that I, I want to do this particularly because I think it's, it's both uh, controversial enough, but yet at the same time helps us to get at really, I think, some of the issues that we are invited to engage with. And I want to do it in correlation with my own perspective as a Pentecostal, so you can see how I'm, I as a Pentecostal might be thinking about some of these things, but in relationship to my tradition and in relationship, I think, to how our traditions can be mutually um, informing. So what about a Wesley after entire sanctification? In other words, what I want to do is let's step back now to Wesley. And of course, to put it quite this way is also to be, in a sense, uh, misleading. We could say something like, if there was ever a time of entire sanctification, then Wesley preceded it, or Wesley initiated it, or Wesley somehow precipitated it. So, um, but, but I think there's a sense in which now I want to ask us to revisit Wesley for a few moments, sort of, in some respects, after entire sanctification, in some respects, after we've had the last couple hundred years to debate entire sanctification, and to maybe hear him for a few moments afresh. Um, I've had this now in my library for 25 years. It's a nice little book, and it's very readable. John Wesley, A Plain Account of Christian Perfection. Somebody say amen on this one? Amen. All right, here we go. Um, and I'm just going to take a few minutes to give you his 11, his 11 points, a brief summation of his views here, that in 1764 he penned in, ter in, in responding to questions that he and others had been having to deal with on this particular, on this particular issue. So, what is uh, Christian perfection? Number one, there is such a thing as perfection, for it is again and again mentioned in Scripture. As you might recall, Wesley was a man of the book, the Bible. Number two, it is not so early as justification, for justified persons are to go on to perfection. And then he cites Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. So what he wants to say there is that justification happens, and after justification is what we want to call sanctification. Number three, it is not so late as death, for St. Paul speaks of living men that were perfect, citing Philippians 3, verse 15. So somewhere between justification and death, sanctification happens, or uh, Christian perfection happens. Number four, it is not absolute. Absolute perfection belongs to man. I'm sorry, belongs not to man, nor to angels, but to God alone. So this is a kind of non-absolute perfection. It's a perfection that's not quite perfection. Sort of uh, attempt to live into that, that space here. It does not make any man, person, infallible. None is infallible while he remains in the body. Uh, one of the distinctions that Wesley and others with him made with regard to this issue of infallibility in terms of the absoluteness of perfection was to talk about two kinds of sin, right? Uh, sins of omission or sin and sins of commission, for instance. So sins of commission would be sins that uh, we know that we shouldn't be doing something, but yet we do it in any case. Right? That's a, a conscious recognition that, we're, uh, that we shouldn't go there, we shouldn't do this, but yet there is, for any number of different reasons, the persistence in, in uh, engaging with these activities or behaviors that we know we shouldn't be. Um, sins of omission, on the other hand, um, Wesley would, would want us to think about in terms of the ways in which we in finite, frail, vulnerable bodies, um, oftentimes we might uh, do things that we don't intend to. They're not good for us, they may hurt other people, but that's the difference between what we know intentionally that we're supposed to avoid, but yet we persist in pr pursuing, and what we, um, uh, just by virtue of our finitude, by virtue of our humanity, uh, 
fail, fall short, and so on. So the sense in which here, in terms of infallibility, there's no infallibility in terms of only God is completely holy and absolutely perfect, and God doesn't commit either sins of uh, commission or sins of omission, right? Uh, but us creatures, uh, even those for whom uh, we might have uh, attained in some respect or received in some respect the blessing of perfection or the blessing of sanctification, uh, we might, we're not infallible. So our fallibility might open us up to, in fact does, open us up to sins of omission. That just is part and parcel of the, of the human condition. So number six, is it sinless? It is not worthwhile to contend for a term, Wesley writes. Instead, it is salvation from sin. So he, again there, I mean, you, you get the sense that, well, it's not sinless if we want to in, insist it's uh, uh, no sins of omission either. Sins of omission are simply part and parcel of what we all have to deal with. So in that respect, none of us ever attains that kind of sinless perfection in which we never commit sins of omission. Number seven, it is perfect love, John, 1 John 4.18. This is the essence of it. Its properties or inseparable fruits are rejoicing evermore, praying without ceasing, and in everything giving thanks. Okay. Um, so Wesley was trying to say, well, we try to think of whether we sin or not, sinless fallibility or infallibility, we're always then thinking about we are, what we're supposed to avoid doing sinning. He wanted to frame it more positively, right? That, that Christian perfection or Christian sanctification involves living into this perfect love. And, you know, his, he, he describes these, this, this way of life as ever more rejoicing, praying without ceasing, and everything giving thanks. You can well imagine that if you were doing those three things, Evermore rejoicing, praying without ceasing, and everything good thing giving thanks, it's difficult to commit sins of commission, right? If we're always being thankful, always in prayer, and always rejoicing. Um, so you get a sense in which, in which um, Wesley is attempting to invite us to think about perfection as a way of life rather than in terms of uh, specific kinds of acts, although specific kinds of acts certainly are involved in it. Number eight, it is improvable. It is so far from lying in an indivisible point, from being incapable of increase, that one perfected in love may grow in grace far swifter than he did before. That's interesting, right, also. Uh, we're often used to thinking about perfection as if, if we attain a certain level of perfection. I mean, you can't get any better than perfect according to a certain way of thinking about perfection. But Wesley here is saying, well, no, it's improvable. I mean, there's a... In other words, uh, you know, this, this encounter with God, this blessing that we receive from God, uh, allows for increase, allows for growth in grace. You can, it's almost like it allows us to go from rejoicing evermore to being to ever even more. It allows us to go from praying without ceasing to even more without ceasing. It allows us to, uh, in everything, give thanks to in everything even more giving thanks. Somehow. Number nine. It is submissible, capable of being lost, of which we have numerous instances, but we were not thoroughly convinced of this until five or six years ago. So you can see even by 1764, there were some debates about uh, perfection, its improvability, and its um, uh, lostability. <laughs> New word, I guess. Um, Consistent, I think, within the, this Wesleyan Arminian tradition of uh, saying that, that Christian lives are dynamic journeys and, and the improvability indicates that we're on this path. Uh, and this path means that you can, you can continue on it or you can get off it at some point or you can backslide, if you will. Right? So that's also something that, according to a certain level, a certain notion of perfection would suggest. Well, there's, how could you lose something if you've already attained that kind of a thing? Uh, now, again, there was a debate, though, right? By 1764, Wesley says that um, we, we had numerous uh, instances, but yet we still wrestled with whether or not we could lose it up until five or six years ago. And, and, and we can, there's, there's census in which um, those debates continue, and we'll come, up, come to that in just a moment. It is, number 10, it is constantly both preceded and followed by a gradual work. 
okay? So this puts our finger on another aspect of perfection as was debated or considered or wrestled with in the mid uh, 18th century. If it's preceded and followed by a gradual work, then uh, the implication is that at a moment in time, we can still somehow experience this perfection. This moment in time experience of perfection is preceded by a, a process, a process of God's work in our lives, and it's succeeded by an ongoing process of God's work in life. We might want to talk about that successive work as that improvability dimension, right? So Christian perfection suggests itself as, in terms of how Wesley and his colleagues and opponents were trying to wrestle with it, uh, could occur at a point in time. And there's a sense in which, uh, both within Wesley's time and after Wesley's time, uh, one of the paradigmatic exemplars of this point in time, this experiential occasion, uh, and, and, and Wesley and others wrestle with this. For instance, the, the paradigmatic exemplary uh, experience of this was Wesley's own experience, own encounter, right? His heart strangely warmed. And there's a sense in which that, uh, that encounter, that moment in time experience is one that many people can give a kind of testimony to. The, the big question about that was, okay, does, God, does the Holy Spirit do, does God do something very particular in that moment, such as bring about Christian perfection or bring about an entire sanctification? Or is that simply one of uh, any innumerable moments that this constantly being preceded and followed by a gradual work points to? So there's this wrestling going back and forth in which uh, the, the testimony of encounter with God takes very, very strong, gives very strong impetus to think about uh, this encounter, this second blessing as happening after justification. Justification takes care, forgives us of our sins, whereas uh, sanctification uh, uh, transforms us into living into God's perfect love. Number 11, but is it in itself instantaneous or not? And then in examining this, let us go step by step. And then there's no, a couple, two or three pages about this instantaneousness of this. So you can see this number 11 opens up into the questions that now lead us into the next couple hundred years. So um, I think one of the big questions about sanctification, nobody is going to question or debate or deny its graduality. Number 10, preceded and followed by a gradual work. We all assume that's the case, right? So that's never been a point of contention. The major question for, during, even during Wesley's time and then after that is, is there a sense in which we can talk about a distinctive experience, a distinctive encounter with God, a distinctive moment in time? Can we date our entire sanctification experience as, for example, we might be able to date our conversion experience, right? So to the degree that traditions have a definitive datability for the born-again experience, justification, new birth, Okay. Then, in this particular tr tradition, the follow-up question is, well, have you been sanctified? If we can date the new birth, will we receive the forgiveness of sins? Can we, in some respects, date uh, when, the, when, when God accomplished his perfecting work in our hearts? Not just forgiving us our sins, but transforming us in a way so that we will thereafter yearn to do things like rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Before which we might have rejoiced some of the times, prayed some of the times, given thanks for some of the things, but this encounter with the Holy Spirit, this encounter with God, um, that, that, uh, that removes, if you will, and this is part of what the debate was, does it eradicate the sin nature? Does it somehow remove even the, uh, the desire to commit sins intentionally? Now again, there was no debate about the fact that we, were, we didn't become immortal, we didn't become unhuman, we remain in our physical bodies, and insofar as we remain in these conditions, we will still always be set by temptations, by tiredness, by all of the different things that mark our human finitude. The question was, uh, can we actually experience this encounter with God that removes the urge for us to, be, to commit sins uh, consciously? And that's where the debate begins to take off in the 19th and into the 20th centuries. Instantaneous or progressive? 
inbred sin, and one of the things I was used to wrestle with this, with this was, is, this, is the sin nature eradicated? This is later Wesleyans using some of this language. Is the sin nature removed, right? So that now we can finally, truly, and fully do the things that God wants us to do. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. As opposed to before where we would be tempted to do things otherwise. Uh, in the 19th and 20th century, and, and certainly even during, even during Wesley's, uh, Wesley's time, uh, there was some connection between uh, this experience of Christian perfection and sanctification and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That gets picked up, particularly in the 19th century. And the 19th century holiness uh, theologians and believers and, and, and pastors and, and, and ministers, uh, Phoebe Palmer, along with uh, many, many others, uh, saw much more closer of a connection between the second blessing of the Holy Spirit and this perfecting work of grace, right? So justification, God declares us righteous. Sanctification, God makes us righteous. God remakes us so that we now live fully into this uh, call to perfection that is there before us. It's a second act of grace for 19th and 20th century holiness folks as they continue to attempt to live into this, uh, into this Wesleyan uh, theme. The, even in 1764, as we read, right, there was still this debate about, okay, can this actually happen at a certain point in time? And, um, and of course, then all the pastoral and practical questions get unfolded, which is what leads into the 19th and 20th century into all these debates. If it actually does happen, then what does it mean to say that uh, we don't sin willfully, right? And uh, as you might well guess, I mean, once you get a, a generation or two removed, um, next, later generations will want to attempt to understand this even more specifically. And in the holiness tradition, uh, there were a number of different kinds of versions that developed, right? Uh, well, of course, if you are entirely sanctified, then you will not only pray without ceasing, you will not only rejoice evermore, you not only give thanks for everything that God has given to us, but you will also not do all the things that the world does, which is sin. And you can start seeing now, um, as, you're, uh, as, as, the, as, these, as these believers are attempting to, say, to understand how this works out practically, you can well imagine that as each generation wrestles with the nature of sin and, and the expressions of sin, then holiness from generation to generation gets redefined in terms of what we're sanctified from and what we're sanctified to, right? So um, when theaters came along and theaters were evil and bad, then of course, if you're entirely sanctified, then you never went to theaters. I mean, and of course, if you were rejoicing evermore and praying without ceasing and giving thanks for all things, you wouldn't have time to go to theaters, right? Amen. <laughs> yeah. Um, and of course, if you had time to go to theaters, then that obviously meant that you weren't really praying without ceasing, because how could you have found yourself at a place like that if, in fact, you were entirely sanctified? Um, now, that's sort of a, a, a... But my point is that the different generations, of course, had to understand, well, well yeah, what a, how does this look? What does it look for us to live out Christian perfection? What does it look for us to live out holiness uh, in, in our space and in our time? And so, and, and what does it mean then for us to be entirely sanctified? Well, going to a movie theater or not, I mean, that might be, you know, you either are or you're not. <laughs> um, but how do we talk about um, aspects related to jealousy or envy or greed? At what point, do you, when you want something, is it just wanting as opposed to greed? Okay. Um, those get a little bit more difficult to parse and to measure and to determine uh, how that was. And, and, you know, of course, for Wesley and for many holiness folks, nobody could really claim to be entirely sanctified. I mean, for one thing, then you'd actually have to live up to all the assumptions about what that meant. Uh, and for the other thing, of course, the point was that well, if you're really entirely sanctified, then you're one of the things that, that, that happen. One of the things that happens is you become... Uh, very humble before God, and nobody who's claiming that they're entirely sanctified is quite humble, right? So there were ways in which the movement wrestled with uh, the, the conundrums, both the logical and the theological conundrums, and that's in part why the debates continue to unfold after, after the 18th century, into the 19th century, and certainly into the early 20th century. Well, in the 1940s, for instance, um, theologians like Reinhold Niebuhr 
began to invite us to think about sin in social or in systemic terms. We invite us to think about the moral life as uh, uh, in terms of its social, social context, right? So those kinds of ways of thinking, for instance, about um, sin or about morality would already also then reframe the context within which we think about sanctification. If, if uh, sanctification had to do with uh, individual personal postures, dispositions, habits, and practices, then when God sanctifies us and perfects us, then God will reorient our personal dispositions, practices, postures, and ways of engaging with the world. But what happens if now sin is not understood only as what we do, but in relationship to the social context that actually shapes our options, our choices, and so on? Now here's my point. The 20th century, uh, I think, puts a lot of strain on the way in which sanctification is, has been inherited and received in the Wesleyan holiness tradition, in part because there are a number of different uh, um, meta-level sort of developments that reshaped ways of thinking about sin, for instance, and, and Niebuhr's notion of thinking about sin in systemic and structural and social terms being one of them. Another one would, for instance, be thinking about human nature, right? Um, if in, up, into, up, in, up and through Wesley's time, and we're not, I'm not saying that Wesley was an Augustinian in this sense, but, and I'm not saying that Wesley was an Aristotelian in, in the many ways in which Aristotelian understandings of human nature existed in the 18th century, but the point is something like this, right? That um, uh, in the broader context of the 18th century, August, within, the, within the Christian tradition, Augustinian and Aristotelian understandings of human nature were still quite assumed. Um, natures were substances that inherited in things, which is in part why the sin nature could be passed on through the act of concupiscence, as one example, which is in part why uh, depravity and original sin could be passed on from one generation to another generation. In other words, sin and its nature were thought of in, in these sort of more substantial terms, if you will. And, and, and of course, substance means a lot of different uh, things, but nevertheless, one of the things it does mean is that it can be passed on in certain ways. Well, in the 20th century, um, substances begin to break down. Actually, a bit before that, right? I mean, um, thinking about uh, evolution in the 18th and 19th century begins to reshape the ways in which we think about substances. Thinking about uh, the nature of the cosmos in more relational terms in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, including after Whitehead, in that case, things are not so much substances, but things are relationships, right? So what happens when sin is reconceived in social terms? What happens when natures are, received, uh, are conceived in relational terms? Then at some point, the question begins to be, well, how do we understand sanctification if we might not think that the first thing it relates to is um, the perfecting of souls, the perfecting of human substantive spirits, if you will, right? Because now all of a sudden human persons are relationally defined, human persons are socially uh, understood, human persons are uh, understood within a different kind of, of cosmic and uh, ontological framework. So entire sanctification, when before it meant the removal of the sin nature, the, the eradication, if you will, of this inbred sin, um, now, what happens if that nature wasn't there to begin with, or if we can't quite put our finger on some kind of substantive soul to begin with? Um, we might have to rethink what sanctification might mean in that context. All right, I want to take a few moments now to invite you to think with me, because uh, I haven't actually wrestled with most of this stuff as much over 25 years as I have with this stuff. But I think there's some parallels for us as we think about these kinds of issues. In part because, you know, for us in the Pentecostal tradition, it's taken for granted that Wesley was what we would call a grandfather. So you have grand grandfathers having children having children. That's the nature of grandparent relationships. And Pentecostalism was, in many respects, birthed out of the holiness movement. So if the holiness movement is the child of Wesley, then Wesley is the grandfather of... And, and, yeah, so that's right. Yeah, the holiness movement is the child of Wesley, and the holiness movement birthed Pentecostalism. 
than Wesley's grandfather Pentecostalism, right? Um, so there's a certain sense in which what I want to do in the next few moments is to think with you through uh, what I might, what we might call spirit baptism in a post-spirit baptism era. I want to give us some parallels here to think about that in order to suggest ways forward for not just Pentecostals like me, but maybe for Christians who are also committed to thinking about holiness. Um, well, spirit baptism, in many respects, um, there's, there's two versions of Pentecostalism in the early 20th century. The one informed directly by the holiness movement thought about spirit baptism in, as a third work of grace. You have justification, then you have sanctification, and then you have spirit baptism. Sanctification removed, is understood complete in holiness terms as removal of the sin nature, uh, but after that, then that allows for uh, the empowering work of the Holy Spirit to send you out to do mission. Okay? So the Wesleyan holiness framework of thinking about sanctification is kept intact, and, it, and to that is added on a third work of grace. Within the non-holiness tradition, the more reformed Keswick tradition, um, there was not as much talk about sanctification as the second work of grace, but there was still the movement from uh, uh, justification to spirit baptism. Spirit baptism now is a follow-up work to justification. Justification gets us right with God. Spirit baptism empowers us to bear witness to the world. So spirit baptism in the Pentecostal tradition um, is related to mission, to witness, and to um, evangelism, and so on and so forth. But in any case, in the Pentecostal tradition, spirit baptism is subsequent to something, whether it's subsequent to something or to some things, right? Something meaning justification or justification and sanctification. Um, Acts 19, um, have you received the Holy Spirit since you first believed? It's one of the questions that was asked of the seven uh, disciples of John the Baptist by Paul. That's one way of translating it, right? Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believe? Well, at one point you believe, justification. Since then, have you received the Holy Spirit? Now, that's, the, that's the King James translation, um, which of course was the only translation for most early Pentecostals. Of course, another translation fully grammatically possible is, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? That's a very different way of ans asking the question, isn't it, right? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? doesn't require this baptism of the Spirit as a subsequent or a second work of grace. But again, according to the King James, it sure seems like it is, right? Um, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? But the point is that the logic of Pentecostal Spirit baptism is in many ways quite similar or actually the identical logic that relates to this issue um, of, of, of sanctification perfection. Then there's, uh, what happens when you receive the Holy Spirit? Well, for the earliest Pentecostals, um, speaking in tongues was a sign of that reception of the Holy Spirit. And that, of course, comes from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, the disciples who were in Cornelius' home uh, recognized that they received the Holy Spirit as we did at first, for we heard them speaking in tongues. That's again a King James translation of that, meaning, right? Oh yeah, we recognized the Holy Spirit had come upon Cornelius, therefore how could we have not baptized them in water? But how do we recognize it? For we heard them speak in tongues as we did at the beginning. So that's what's called for Pentecostals the evidential nature of tongues, that tongues gives us uh, proof. Initial language was a sign. Tongues was a sign of the baptism of the Spirit. As they began to write doctrinal statements, they added evidence. So signs became evidence. And you can well imagine that um, um, this is part of a very uh, organic process here, right? The Puritans in the 17th and 18th centuries were looking for signs of election. Holiness folks in the 19th century were looking for signs of perfection. And the Pentecostals found the signs of spirit baptism. For we heard them speaking in tongues as we did at the beginning. Um, signs became evidences. Speaking in tongues then became physical evidences. 
that became debated, right? Because, um, and again, th this became debated over the course of the 20th century because, okay, what kind of signs? Could there be more than one sign? Um, what, about, what about praying without ceasing? Isn't that a sign? It's a sign of something. Well, sure it's a sign of something. It might be a sign of perfection. But we we'll want to know about signs of spirit baptism that empower for witness. Well, in that case, then, it's, it's a specific kind of sign. It's a physically evidential sign is how the debate continued to unfold, right? Uh, meaning that when you speak in tongues, that's something that happens through physical bodies, and therefore we can therefore um, uh, assert, or uh, we can confirm that this person has been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then there were debates and further debates. Does it have to happen right away? Like, can you get baptized with the Holy Spirit and then not display the sign or the evidential sign or the physical evidential sign right away? And then that led to folks inserting the words initial physical evidence. Now, these extrapolations are all part of wrestling with, okay, how do we really recognize it? Who's really in? Who's really out? Uh, how can we really ascertain you know, what the Holy Spirit is doing in our midst? And these doctrinal formulations were attempts to try to be as precise as possible, right? So some, uh, you know, one of the early Assemblies of God leaders said, well, yeah, I, I really believe I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I didn't speak with tongues until six months later. And that was published in the Pentecostal Evangel, one of the main organs of these newsletters that went out from um, these Pentecostal churches. And I was kind of debated, right? So can, can that really be the case? Can you really have the Holy Spirit for six months? Or why six months? What about a year? What about five years? Uh, how long does it have to be? Um, this in the, so initial physical evidence really uh, said that, well, no, no, we really do need to look for the sign. It's going to be physical. You can really tell. And, and the first thing that's going to happen when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, that's why the word initial was stuck in there, was that you can speak in tongues. So that becomes now the crown jewel for Pentecostal theology, whether or not many of us like to wear that crown or not. That's just part of the way it's unfolded over the last hundred plus years. And it's wax and wane. Um, again, I'm trying to give us parallels here to how initial evidence has been contested and wrestled with. Um, I've given you just a brief snapshot of all the different additions and attempts to articulate the doctrine uh, as the generations went on. Some continue to have it in their books as part of their affirmation, but really don't pay a whole lot of attention to it. Uh, the, I don't know if there are any Foursquare folks around here, but I know that the Foursquare folks, even right now, are revisiting their statement on this particular issue, and there's a real strong move to revise it, to try to uh, understand it maybe a little bit differently. Um, we could say certainly that there are a number, particularly the, um, the non-white uh, Pentecostal traditions, the uh, Hispanic Pentecostal movements, the Afro-African-American Pentecostal churches, Oftentimes they'll have um, sign language, but not evidence language, right? They'll have, and, and again, these churches that all go back to this, all have this sign language there, but they don't have the evidence language. They certainly don't have the physical evidence language. They don't, they don't have the initial physical evidence language. And uh, a lot of times, a lot of these statements uh, are signed, but they're not a, an exclusive sign. In other words, it's simply stated that, yeah, this is a sign of the Spirit, but it doesn't say it's the only sign, right? So a lot of these um, uh, ethnic Pentecostal church traditions, uh, in many respects, recognize and receive tongues as a sign. But for them, prophecy could be a sign. Dreams and visions could be a sign. Any of the other phenomenon that you see in the book of Acts could be signs of the Spirit's baptism. So there's an interesting spectrum of ways in which church traditions have sort of held this position over the last hundred years. And uh, charismatic renewal in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, I think, um, it, as, they, as they touched upon mainline Protestant churches and denominations, as well as they, as they touched upon um, the Roman Catholic Church and Orthodox churches, um, that also introduced a whole other level of uh, variety and a spectrum of understandings. Uh, now, all of a sudden, speaking in tongues was a sign of not, not a whole lot. It was, it was more just simply one of the practices that, that were part and parcel of 
charismatic spirituality as might be manifest in charismatic Bible studies, charismatic groups, etc., etc., etc. And and so there's a certain sense in which charismatic renewal in the last 50 years, last generation or so, has uh, induced a kind of what we might say post-initial evidence era for us, in which the language is still there. So we're, we're, by post, I don't mean that we've forgotten it. By post, I don't mean that uh, it is no longer uh, an issue. Uh, but I simply mean by post that it's just a lot more complicated than what it was from uh, uh, earlier on. So here's where sort of the Pentecostal tradition is in terms of how they've, uh, this, this particular issue has unfolded sort of with, as, as uh, grandkids of Wesley. And then part of the question would be, um, where do we go from here? I want to spend a few minutes talking about what I call life in the spirit from a 21st century, century Pentecostal perspective in order perhaps to help us also think about um, holiness in the 21st century within these particular traditions. So um, how might Pentecostal and charismatic traditions think about life in the spirit in this maybe what we might call uh, post-initial evidence milieu? By post, again, not that it's no longer there, but that it's, it's part and parcel of a much wider set of issues, realities, challenges, and opportunities. Um, so first, the first thing to say would be something like, well, in a post-initial evidence uh, milieu, it's certainly not the case that glossolalia, or speaking in tongues, is no longer practiced or not. Or not. In, in fact, we could, we could even say something like, well, uh, in many uh, Pentecostal denominations, in fact, the, the, the research is out there to show it, you know, less than 50% of people in Pentecostal churches speak in tongues, or even have ever speak in tongues, have ever spoken in tongues, or do it in any kind of way or anything like that. Arguably, where speaking in tongues is even more vital is in outside of Pentecostal churches and traditions, in these more charismatic, uh, charismatic movements and, and milieus, if you will. So the point is something like, okay, well, in a post-initial evidence milieu, it's certainly not the case that speaking in tongues is not an issue. It's still practice, and in all kinds of different ways, actually. In fact, we might even say that um, because it's not tied to this issue of evidencing spirit baptism, uh, there's actually a lot more room for it to, for its practice and for its manifestation and for the varieties of contexts within which uh, its practice can unfold. We might even say something like, uh, yeah, in the, if you look at how the role of glossolalia and, that, and how it plays out in charismatic uh, communities, um, glossolalia actually is part of that more revitalized Christian life that within classical Pentecostal communities in which you have something like initial physical evidence, less than 50% of the people even speak in tongues to begin with, and it becomes more, once you check off on the sign, then you're good. Okay? So um, the doctrine actually doesn't help in that respect. You might even say something like the doctrine uh, uh, reduces the role in which and the functionality, if you will, of the experience and, and, and narrows it so that it doesn't have the full range of expressions that it might have in context within which that doctrine is a part and parcel of the expectation. Of course, we need to, you know, when we're trying to think theologically about it, we need to, we need to think back to the scripture. And, and you know, we, can, we need to go back to um, Acts, Acts 2, Acts 10, Acts 19, and we need to keep grappling and wrestling with that. I think one of the big questions for Pentecostals is the reaction is to try to shore up the tongues material in Acts. We know exactly where it appears, those three passages. Well, the argument is maybe in Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 8. It's not quite exactly mentioned there. Um, and, and so for some, if we're concerned about the fact that, well, only less than half, half of the Pentecostal believers speak in tongues, so we need to really foreground it more. Um, but what about the fact that outside of our Pentecostal communities, this is happening quite frequently, apart from the doctrine? Okay? Uh, what else might we want to observe about the scriptural witness within which this, the narratives within which these references to glossolalia unfold? How else might we want to understand the work of the Spirit more broadly? So one of the things I think that Pentecostals have begun to focus on is begun to focus on the work of the Spirit in the early church 
if you want, and then try to understand glossolalia within this broader narrative rather than trying to zero in and capture this, the, these, uh, these issues of glossolalia. In other words, try to understand tongues as part of the larger work of the Spirit rather than try to simply focus in on tongues as sort of the crown jewel, if you will. And these are some of the strategies that are taking place. And then uh, going even broader than that, right? Uh, how do we understand the work of the Spirit, the life of the Spirit, not just in Acts, in, uh, in the apostolic uh, narrative, but in the rest of the New Testament? In the work of Paul, in the work of John, um, in the work of um, Mark and Matthew. Mark is a particularly uh, troublesome text for Pentecostals, particularly because of the longer ending, which is another one of those places where references to tongues takes place in the context of you know, drinking deadly poison and picking up snakes and all those kinds of things. Um, there's certainly a case in which I think the relevance is that the Markan uh, longer ending has to do with the mission of the church in late uh, uh, first century, maybe into late second century context. And so in that respect, there's, there's relevance for understanding the relationship to, between spirit baptism and mission. But I think the point would be, again, to say rather than focus on the tongues for the sake of tongues, how do we understand the work of the Spirit as attested to by the New Testament in terms of Luke, Paul, and John, and, and develop a more robust, if you will, Pentecostal charismatic theology of the Spirit within which then we can understand the relative relevance of tongues and its role in the Christian life. So I think those are some of the strategies through which Pentecostal theologians are trying to think through, if you will, this legacy of initial evidence in the 21st century. You might even want to say something like the charismatic renewal invites Pentecostals to think through the spirit-filled life really as what they really meant to think about it in the first generation, right? So the first generation Pentecostals weren't intending to start a new movement. I mean, their whole critique of the churches from which they came was that the churches from which we were coming from weren't living the normal Christian life. In other words, they were not living in the Spirit. And so living in the Spirit was not meant to be a sort of super Christianity. Living in the Spirit was meant to be a normal Christianity, right? But over the last hundred years, somehow now, the way Pentecostals have, the language has, has, has uh, evolved or devolved, it's now kind of like, well, if you've got the Spirit, you're, you're the super Christian, whereas all of the regular Christians don't have the Spirit. Um, and that already that, that's already ecumenically inhibitive. So one of the things that are developing, I think, among Pentecostal charismatic theologians and I think movement is to then say, okay, now we can learn something from the charismatic renewal. The charismatic renewal treats the work of the Spirit as part of the normal Christian life. Uh, how can we also continue to think through Pentecostal church? Fine line here, right? I mean, if, if this is truly a distinctive witness of a particular movement, you don't want to water it down to where it's not distinctive. But at the same time, if it erects ecumenical barriers so that you're no longer in fellowship with other people because you appear to be elitist or have something that other Christians don't, then that's also, you could argue, not a manifestation of the spirit-filled life to begin with. <laughs> And so you've got to wrestle between where is this sort of witness and testimony on the one hand, challenge to the broad, broader body of Christ on the one hand, but yet also the sort of recognition that, yeah, the spirit-filled life, the spirit-empowered life is the normal Christian life. And what does that mean for us that have to get up in the morning, go to work, raise kids, and so on and so forth. All right, I want to close then by um, thinking about, come back to sanctification and and sort of step back out on a limb here and make some Pentecostal suggestions about thinking about a contemporary theology of holiness uh, in light of some of these parallels, right? So we've, we've, we've sort of wrestled with the uniqueness of this, or perhaps maybe coming out on the other side and wanting to reintegrate, if you will, this distinctive witness, but within the broader framework and fabric of, of a more fully orbed theological perspective. How can we, in other words, and now consider sanctification in similar terms. And I want to make a couple of suggestions. Um, <clears throat> so sanctification as experience and spirituality. I mean, there's a sense in which what we want to say is something like, if in the prior generations, the quest was always for that experience, for that exp which is not to say that we don't want to encounter questing after God. 
Which is not to say that we don't want to encount, uh, encourage tarrying before God. And maybe that's something that we need to, to keep thinking about, right? I mean, we're, we're moving too fast to tarry for anything at this point. Um, so it's, it's not about minimizing the importance of the encounter and the quest. But it's about understanding the encounter and the quest within the broader framework of this journey with God. With this broader experiential matrix of what it means for us to be people of God. To understand this encounter experience as part and parcel of this ongoing journey, of this ongoing life with God, this uh, ongoing spirituality with God. Um, and, and again, just as Pentecostals have to revisit the, the New Testament, I think that's always part of what the theological task is. You know, revisiting um, the scriptures, uh, revisiting the traditional uh, loci and uh, where our, our crown jewels are found. Right? So for the Pentecostals, it's certain texts. Uh, in the role of John in the Wesleyan uh, holiness imagination in terms of the text talking about the love of God. But again, then continuing to synthesize that across the full scope of the New Testament. You know, what does Luke have to say about holiness? What does Matthew and Mark have to say about holiness? What does Paul have to say about holiness in terms of the Spirit of God pouring out in our hearts, for instance? So thinking about uh, a holiness uh, both within the context of an encounter with God and also within the context of the bigger narrative and framework of which God is calling us in the salvation journey. That's what I'm referring to in this, in this parenthesis, as being set apart for God's purposes, right? Uh, I think all too often um, holiness as something that I gain or I get in order to live sinlessly, not that that's not good, right? But living sinlessly. What's that for again? Just for living sinlessly? Um, what, what divine purposes does that serve? What, what is God calling us in our sinlessness or holiness or sanctification or perfection to? Where are we headed, in other words, with holiness as opposed to, oh, well, I'm now praying without ceasing. Wow, well, isn't that great? Okay, what's, what am I praying without ceasing for? Right? Where's this going in terms of um, uh, a biblical theology that orients us in, in our journey uh, with God? Of course, as a Pentecostal, I would want us to keep thinking also about the work of the Spirit in the holy life, right? And, and that, I think, uh, helps us to understand holiness not just as something that we attain, not just as something that uh, even that we desire in our, our own selves. I think we can also say something like, well, our desire for holiness has to be there in part because the Spirit births that in our, in our spirit. The Spirit calls our spirit. So toward what I would call a pneumatological theology of sanctification in which the Spirit births, the Spirit calls, the Spirit lures, the Spirit, if you will, pulls, the Spirit seduces, um, the Spirit draws us toward perfection in love. The Spirit draws us into relationship with God. Right? Um, how does that work out in terms of praying without ceasing and, and these kinds of practices that are now not just things we do, but are, is, is our communion with God through the Holy Spirit. So, I think what I'm in part trying to get at, and which I've been helped by Holiness, contemporary holiness theologians, is, is, is trying to rethink sanctification and holiness as the more or less normal Christian life. Again, this is not necessarily to eliminate the importance of thinking about a second blessing. I think one of the advantages of a second blessing is that it invites us to a more. To think about a second blessing is to think about what else does God have for me, right? One of the dangers of second blessing is that, oh yeah, I've got it and you don't. And now I've, all of a sudden, I am somehow better than you. I mean, we might never say that out loud to anybody, but that's the nature of these versions of the higher Christian life, which I'm going to touch on actually tonight and how it plays out in a practical way for both traditions, both Pentecostals and for, for holiness folks. So, so again, I don't want to necessarily eliminate second blessing, but I want us to keep thinking through it in ways that will avoid this kind of elitism, this kind of triumphalism 
And that's why, again, sanctified holiness as the more or less normal Christian life. Uh, the, this more or less is a way for us to be, to be comfortable on the one hand with the fact that God's doing something, but also uncomfortable, meaning that there's, there's something else. And, and the uncomfortable is not in order for us to feel guilty about the fact that we're less, right? But the, but the uncomfortableness is about a sense in which how can, the Spirit, how can the Spirit continue to draw us to go deeper, if you will. And that's why I want to then think about what I call not just a pneumatological, but an eschatological theology of holiness. Pentecostals really wrestle with this whole eschatology thing, and I think some holiness folks do as well, to the degree that both holiness and Pentecostal traditions have been deeply shaped by dispensationalism in the 19th century, we all have certain notions about eschatology, about when Jesus is coming back to rescue the church and end everything. Well, that's not what I'm referring to when I refer to eschatology, right? That very well may happen, but I want to uh, highlight some other aspects uh, about eschatology, which I do think have been coming back in the 20th century in terms of thinking about the message of Jesus and the work of Jesus, uh, thinking about uh, the apostolic community as an eschatological community. Um, Thinking about New Testament eschatology of hope, uh, New, New Testament eschatology in terms of hope that is both coming, therefore not yet, but also in some paradoxical way now. Uh, from a Pentecostal point of view, there are a couple passages I think that are helpful. Um, when Peter gets up to speak, this is in Acts 2, when Peter gets up on the day of Pentecost to explain to the crowd what was happening, they were, they were asking, what, what's, what, what means this? Uh, so Luke records Peter quoting Joel. And what's recorded is the message that Peter said, in the last days, quoting Joel, but in the last days is not quite in Joel. Uh, Joel simply is in that day, uh, after that time. But Peter's language is, um, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Well, in that respect, the last days started right there in Acts 2, right? And, and so then Luke, in, uh, in accounting and talking about Jesus' account, mentions that Jesus says that uh, the kingdom of God is here in your midst. Okay, so I want to talk about biblical hope as existing in the present day of the Lord, even if at the same time it is anticipating the unfolding of that day. So it's both present, but also not. That's more or less, right, that we talked about. Um, um, and and how, do the, how might these eschatological horizons help us now to orient holiness? So that, again, we're, we're moving away from natures and substances, and we're moving toward dynamics. We're moving toward trajectories. We're moving toward dispositions. We're moving toward movement. <laughs> we're moving toward movement, right? We're, in other words, holiness is not just for my human nature. But holiness is for orienting me toward something, toward the kingdom of God, toward uh, mission, toward um, a, 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 more, a more closer relationship with God, etc. Right? Um, so the, es the eschatological, therefore, allows us this now and yet not yet through which the Spirit can call and inspire us. And so I'd like first to think about maybe understanding holiness in this kind of eschatological way. Right, a, 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 a sense of holiness that uh, orients us toward God, toward the coming kingdom, even as it enables us to engage with God and with the work of God in the present moment. I've, I'd like to hear you share your thoughts on the subject of dramatic transformation where a miracle changes a person's life from sin to powerful ministry. There, you have a number of examples, and there are other examples as well. Amen and hallelujah. <laughs> Paul is uh, another example, scriptural example, in terms of um, these things. So um, I would want to insist upon the fact that these can happen and do happen. Um, I think the big challenge for us would be how can we think about these examples in relationship to those whose lives don't they, don't, they don't have that particular testimony, right? So what I think we want to do is we want to affirm that God acts 
in all kinds of ways, gradually, but also in these very powerful moments. Whether it's the falling off the horse moment, whether it's the conversion moment, whether it's, you know, in my particular case, my own experience of spirit baptism, 12 years old at a church camp, spoken tongues for three hours, right, uh, at the age of 12. Um, and that's in part why I've never thought about not being a Pentecostal. I mean, that's, uh, you don't have an experience like that and just walk away from it. And so it's been very difficult for me, although I've tried to get away from the Assemblies of God for all my life. But in any case, uh, so, you know, I do, I do want to affirm that there can be very, very intense, powerful, transformative encounters that we can have with God. Um, I want to affirm also that God can sometimes use very, very intense episodes, tragi tragedies in our lives. We might not initially say that those were God moments, um, but, but we can't be struck by tragedy and not have it deeply touch us or wound us. But I would want to say that if God can bring redemptive work out of that, then that also becomes a moment in which something intensely powerful happened. And initially, we didn't call it a God encounter. But in looking back on it, we might say that God showed up in that, in that time or through that time. And so my, my point would be, yes, yes, obviously. I mean, our lives are lived day to day in some respects, moment to moment. If you will, God can break in, life can break in, right? Uh, how do we recognize God? And then I also want to keep talking about the folks for whom they've never had these kinds of encounters that they can testify to. And what I don't want to say is I don't want to say to them, well, the Holy Spirit's never been at work in your life. So, I think that's where, we, that's where the tension is, and, and that's why I think we need to talk about both of these, if that makes any sense. Question. Uh, Tim Finlay, um, I really like your um, parallels between uh, entire sanctification within the holiness movement and then the spirit baptism within the uh, charismatic tradition. Um, my uh, heritage on my father's side is, is from Wales, and we had the 1905 revival, which was both Methodism, holiness, right. and charismatic. Yeah. Um, uh, I was wondering if you had anything to say with regards to this sort of large-scale renewal that, that what is occasionally seen in that, in that sort of thing, where you have right. lots of people, you know, no longer swearing as, uh, yeah, as, yeah, as they're yeah. going down yeah. the mines right. and things like right. that. Right. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. Um, I, I would want to think about these revivals as uh, social expressions of what happens in these individuals falling off the horse moments, right? So that just as God strikes an individual, they fall off the horse, life gets turned around. Revivals are when larger groups experience this kind of uh, encounter with God over an extended period of time and then whole communities get transformed. So that happened in, in any number of these revivals that we can talk about, whether it's Pentecostal one at the Zulu Street, the one in Wales, then going back, of course, to Great Awakenings and so on. Um, and of course, in any one of these, particularly with the Great Awakenings as a way for us to think about this, um, God can be at work in all kinds of powerful ways, even as that doesn't mean we're off the hook from trying to discern everything that's going on, right? Um, so, at the in individual level, I would want to say something like, okay, somebody goes to a revival or somebody has a powerful encounter, they come out transformed, but yet at the same time, sometimes we might see uh, continuities from their former life that remain, if you will, in the mix. And so, uh, this powerful transformation um, doesn't mean that there is absolutely no continuity between the before and the after. So similarly, revivals, lots of things happening, and even therefore all the more complex in terms of multiplicities of personalities, lives, and, and so on, um, and therefore all the more difficult to discern in terms of these manifestations, these expressions. But I would definitely want to see those as, um, yeah, extraordinary blessings of God at a certain level that catch up whole communities over extended periods of time. A lot more to clean out, 
and a lot more complicated also as a result of the aftermath of some of these things. Question. Kent Wachemeyer. In both the classroom and the church, I find the language of perfection very difficult to talk about. Nobody wants to talk about that. It's, even the language of sanctification is very hard to talk about. Um, you've, you've talked about some of the reasons behind that, the diversity of, of understandings. Uh, what else can you say about why in our world of generic evangelicalism are those words, even though they're biblical, why are they so difficult mm. to talk about? Mm. And, the, and the second part, maybe I'm presupposing my answer on you. I'd like to hear more of is the answer, the, actually. Is the, <laughs> is the um, spiritual formation movement a logical extension of the holiness movement? Hmm. Is that an easier language for people to use than sanctification and perfection? So I think what your question invites me to think about is how our rhetoric actually may support or not. Um, so the first thing that came to mind as I was hearing your question, I, and maybe you have some answers, which I'd be very interested in hearing as well, but the first thing that came to my mind was, I wonder how Eugene Peterson's translation talks about you know, where, where these, this language of, of sanctification and holiness and perfection show up, right? Um, so part of me, therefore, in particular, specific response to your question is, okay, what kind of synonyms could we use that might make it more easy for us as a body of Christ in the 21st century to talk about? That's one, and that might be a very pragmatic response. Okay, this language turns people off, so let's just develop new, new synonyms for these kinds of things. Um, I do think that, but, it, but in terms of the bigger problem, so I, I think that if we want to get beyond the fact, we want to go beyond just simply saying, well, we'll get just a, a nomenclature problem, and we want to get to the real theological issues, then I do think, you know, the notion of perfection as orientation toward completion, um, which is what I'm trying to get at when I talk about the eschatological sort of framework within which, right? So that, that completion um, allows for, perhaps it might allow for us to think about how God's work can be both complete, but yet, to use Wesley's term, improvable. And if we can find more ways to communicate that, Perhaps that might be, um, part, part, might be part of the, the solution for us to be more comfortable. Uh, there's a certain sense in which you know, the language is challenging because when we think of something as complete, it's the end. Well, what else, what else do we do after that? Um, if we've reached the end, because of the way we're structured, we're, we're hopeful, anticipatory, um, aspirational, desiring. Um, well, if we reach the end, then... Well, I go. To, I got to go somewhere else to look for what to look forward to. Um, how can we? How can we think about completion as yet part of God's ongoing sort of call to us? So, I don't know if you had anything that I'd like to hear what you have to say. And is the spiritual formation. Oh, spiritual formation. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Is that an attempt to, to do that? I'm not going to answer for Dallas Willard, but I will say I do think that. One of the reasons why for formational projects have begun to emerge is I think that we have begun to recognize that the work of the Spirit, and even among Pentecostals, so it's not just evangelicals and the holiness folks, but we're going to recognize that the work of the Spirit uh, is not abstracted from our embodiment and our historicity. And in that respect, we can... And actually, I think Finney was recognized this, right? I mean, he, for him, it was like, well, um, if we tarried, if we put ourselves in a posture dispositionally toward the Spirit, I mean, we can practice certain things that can perhaps make it more likely that the Spirit of God will show up, right? I mean, that's the whole point about tarrying at a certain level, right? It's orienting ourselves in a certain physical posture in order to allow God to do what God wants to do. So my point would be something like, I think we're, I think, you know, the, one of the challenges that, that modernity and the enlightenment bequeathed was to say, well, the spirit is somewhere out there, but we've got nature and flesh and humanity that's down here. And in that respect, so it was this binary, this bifurcation between 
the reality of the spirit and, if you will, the human reality. But I do think that uh, formational programs are now, I think, more and more uh, widespread in part because we, I think, now realize that, well, just like Luke said, you know, the spirit is poured out upon what? Not souls and other spirits, but upon flesh, which means that, that somehow God created this dust of the earth. They have the capacity to, um, to interface with, to engage with, to encounter, uh, to be oriented toward, to be predisposed toward, to be shaped, and, and therefore to anticipate, to desire, etc. right? So uh, to what degree then can we, in that respect, yeah, um, train up ourselves, renew ourselves, to put ourselves in a better position to be able to encounter God? I think that's part of it. Question? Hi, Professor. It's Jose Soto. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is regarding uh, perfection and sanctification. I'm reading uh, 1 John 3, uh, 9 and 10. It says, uh, no one who is born of God will continue to sin in that passage. This is how we know the children of God versus the children of the enemy. How does that really work in terms of sanctification and perfection? Um, the second question is related to uh, the distinctions between um, speaking in tongues and the, the prayer language that is discussed in the scriptures. Um, so there's a misconception uh, within Pentecostals or, or, or different groups that, that either combine the two. Um, so at what point do we uh, consider the differences? Thank you. Um, I think that's in part what I was trying to get. I'll take the second one first real quickly that... Um, Pentecostals, I think, have em over, well, maybe overemphasized, but certainly emphasized the sign character from Acts with regard to tongues. But you're right, and I think that's in part why when we go to Paul or other parts of the New Testament, we can develop, if you will, a more, a more holistic theology of tongues um, that includes a prayer language, that includes worship, that includes, and James has, has material about language. So I think the point would be uh, how might a more full-orbed theology of tongues fit within a more fully pneumatological and eschatological sort of framework. So I think that's, that's certainly very helpful, and that's certainly, I think, what more and more Pentecostals are continuing to think about. Uh, the former one, uh, I might actually want Don Thorson to answer that one. Um, I, I think that Wesley would, would have said something like, well, yeah, if we've been born of the Spirit, we are not going to want to persist in so on a practical level, you, I think you would say something like this, that um, even if we were to continue to lapse into these sins, um, the desire not to lapse or the desire not to persist in it is evidence of the redemptive work of the Spirit. And perhaps that's what the second blessing is about, so that uh, one isn't even perhaps as uh, tempted to continuing in these sins. Um, but yeah, that would be a sense in which you know, sins of commission, sins of omission might, might play a role in there. So I'm sure that Wesleyan theologians have a number of different ways in which they might want to talk about how that, uh, affirm that on the one hand, but see how it, how it unfolds in the Christian life. Question? You mentioned that in the 21st century, there's going to be developments uh, in, in the dialogue of, of holiness towards, um, or there is, there is developments in the dialogue of holiness towards um, uh, the role of Pentecostal spirituality or the role of charismatic spirituality. Who, it, it, it seems to me that there are voices that have been kind of responsible for that development on both sides. So the Pentecostals themselves have been articulating their spirituality towards a middle or a, a, a renewed kind of understanding. And also folks perhaps in the evangelical camp, Clark Pinnock and others, that have been, you know, kind of reaching towards the middle too with their understanding. Who are the voices we should be paying attention to as this dialogue kind of unfolds besides yourself, <laughs> I suppose? Okay, so you're talking about the where Pentecostal evangelicals are meeting particularly, that particular... In, in the spirituality aspect. Oh, okay. Um, Yeah, theology of spirituality. Oh, wow. Um, 
I'd be, I'd welcome suggestions, nominations for uh, the top 10 books in the area or whatever, top 10, you know, I mean, certainly Dallas Willard, uh, you know, uh, now, but yeah, who are, who's meeting with Pentecostal, who are Pentecostals gravitating toward, um, hmm, <laughs> you know, Stephen Land is a Pentecostal, holiness Pentecostal, um, that I think, ha and that was 20 years, well, more than 20 years ago now when he, when he published his book, but it still remains very influential, I think in terms of really groundbreaking and helping Pentecostals sort of come out of their isolationism and, and actually think about the work of the Spirit in a in broader ecumenical context. So in many respects, I would say that that, that that book opened up, his work opened up a huge space for, for, this, for this kind of conversation. Um, I, I, would, I would invite us to think about a guy named Michael McClymond. Um, Michael McClyman, he's an Edwards scholar um, informed by um, uh, charismatic renewal movements, done a lot of revivals. Um, I think building a lot of bridges between, between evangelical and Pentecostal traditions. That would be another one. Any? Final question? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, uh, the, prob the problem with um, uh, sign language involving tongues as you know, it has, has historically been in, in Acts chapter 2, of course, the tongues the apostles are speaking are known, recognizable, historical tongues, or at least they're heard in known, recognizable tongues. And, uh, and as you know, if we just go in canonical order, by, by the time we get to 1 Corinthians, something has changed, and uh, mm -hmm. no longer we're dealing with known tongues, but right. with tongues of men and angels and unknown tongues mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. I, I was just wondering in, in your engagement with the, you know, with the literature on that, that type of thing, uh, does that problem get glossed over or, or have you encountered anyone who actually deals head on with the, with the issue? No. Um, one scholar whose name escapes me right now, but I, but I can see the book cover so if we want to follow up after, we can get that one. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's gray, actually. Um, but I can, I can get that for you. But, but I'll just say real, real quickly that at some level, I don't think that that's been a real problem in this sense, right, that Pentecostals will still nevertheless say that even if you, Paul had to call for interpreters, um, in the in the Pauline text, there's no reason why. I mean, if you have a kind of supernaturalist understanding of Acts anyway, there's no reason why these uh, the miracle couldn't have been one of hearing. For instance, that's one of the arguments made about Acts two, right? Does it have to be a miracle of speech so that people were speaking in languages they didn't know, or really? Uh, actually, the text says that we hear them speaking in our own languages. Well, that's interesting, too. I mean, I mean, where's the miracle really at? And, and I think that's in part the point, that from that particular vantage point, um, I've actually in invited us to think about the whole Pentecostal uh, Pentecost phenomenon as multisensorial, involving uh, a variety of ways and levels within which the Spirit manifests and, and the people of God are encountering. So in that respect, Although I understand your point as well, you know, that, that um, we do need to pay attention to how that, what happens in Acts 2 is different from what happens in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, join me now in thanking Dr. Young for having come. You're going to do the second, uh, you're going to do the second uh, seminar too? Yeah, 6.30. And we're dismissed. Right thank you.